Welcome to video T13C on the taxation of international income. We can start with everything's changed. Okay, that's not entirely true, but quite a bit has. International tax is without question one of the most difficult areas of taxation, and the new tax law has done nothing to end that well-deserved moniker. We were only going to have an overview of the old international tax regime, and that's something that has not changed. We are still only going to have an overview. The four most significant changes are related to a shift to a territorial system. The transitional issues associated with going from the old system to the new system, which will be behind us in a couple of years. The new anti-deferral regime, known as GUILTY, and the U.S. favored regime, known as FDII. Let's start by comparing a territorial tax system to a worldwide tax system. In a worldwide system, the taxpayer is taxed on his, her, or its total worldwide income. For example, the U.S. uses a worldwide income model for individual taxation. If a U.S. citizen moves to Australia for a job, the income they earn in Australia is subject to U.S. income tax. A territorial system taxes only the income generated in the country. From a corporate perspective, the U.S. has a worldwide system that feels like a hybrid system. Let me explain. A U.S. corporation will be taxed on its worldwide income. However, if a U.S. corporation establishes a foreign subsidiary, something called a CFC, or Controlled Foreign Corporation, that subsidiary, as a function of being incorporated in a different country, is not a U.S. resident, and thus will be taxed only on the subsidiary's income in the U.S., which in many instances is none. The earnings of the CFC are not taxed in the U.S. until that subsidiary distributes its income to the U.S. parent through a dividend. This type of dividend is generally not eligible for a dividends received deduction. Now that was the old system. The new system converts the U.S. to a territorial system by permitting a 100% dividends received deduction for dividends received from a CFC. In this way, the CFC income is not taxed in the U.S. All right, let's look at another famous four-column example. In the first column, we have the old U.S. hybrid system. And in this case, the subsidiary pays no dividend. Because Apricot is not a U.S. resident, none of the income is going to be taxed in the U.S. And we're going to ignore foreign taxes throughout this example. In column two, we have the old system with a dividend being paid by the sub up to the parent. In this situation, the $400 dividend is subject to U.S. income tax. In the third and fourth columns, we present the same scenarios but under the new U.S. tax system. Notice that the $400 of foreign income is not included in the U.S. under either scenario, which lends itself to our territorial system. The old system, where U.S. tax rates were 35%, and frankly much higher than most other foreign tax rates, the deferral of income recognition under the timing variable was strongly at play. Think of it as Pear just allowed Apricot's earnings to stay overseas year after year after year. And the amount of unrepatriated earnings left overseas by U.S. companies, frankly, is staggering. The teeny tiny text is from a well-known company who shall not be named, but let's say that it rhymes with Edna Krabappel. If you can read it, it says that at September 2017, over $250 billion with a B was left overseas. And you know, a billion here and a billion there, and before long, you're talking real money. That leads us to the second issue in the new tax law, the transition. As we migrate to a new territorial system, all those foreign earnings can now be left overseas 
were sent home and would be untaxed. And it seemed inappropriate to leave all that unrepatriated money from prior years untaxed. So a transitional program needed to be implemented. The tax law basically measures all the unrepatriated earnings a U.S. company has left overseas. To the extent that it's sitting in cash on the balance sheet, that it will be taxed at a tax rate of 15.5%. If it's not in cash, that's to say it's been used to buy stuff, then it will be taxed at an 8% rate. And this tax is going to apply whether the funds are repatriated or not. So the expected reaction is that U.S. firms will just go ahead and bring the money back since the deferral is no longer available for those old earnings. If you flip back to common column one in our pear and apricot example, the $400 of apricot earnings are finally being taxed. Okay, our next area is where things really start to get hairy. So over the course of this module, we've talked about income shifting between entities. Examples like interest payments that pull income out of the corporation to avoid double tax or my sister, the dentist, paying her daughter a wage. Over the past three or so decades, U.S. companies have been engaged in a very effective and totally legal income shifting strategy that uses international tax. In my example, we're going back to my favorite Caribbean island, Grand Cayman. So we've previous, previously discussed that one strategy Pear could employ is the magic POS operating system developed by Pear is an intangible, that's a patent. And that could be housed in Grand Cayman. POS is indispensable to the Pear products and thus, of course, commands a high value. Pear Grand Cayman, the CFC of Pear located in Grand Cayman and organized under Grand Cayman law, owns the patent to POS and Pear US can only sell, sell Pear products in the US by paying a licensing fee to Pear Grand Cayman. This does two things. The first is it shifts income from Pear US to Pear Grand Cayman. The second thing it does is it permits the deferral of that income nearly indefinitely, and that would have been true under the old system and remains true under the new system. What's amazing is that the only asset Pear Grand Cayman owns is a piece of paper giving them title to the patent. There are no operations in the Grand Cayman, no employees in Grand Cayman, and no income other than what is sold to Pear. The guilty tax is a direct attack on this type of income shifting. In effect, what guilty does is to redetermine that a reasonable return for Pear Grand Cayman is 10%. Any return in excess of that amount is going to be taxed. Thus, an office with no property, payroll, or operations is going to be lightly capitalized. And so 10% of nearly zero is nearly zero. And so most of Pear Grand Cayman's income will now be subject to the guilty tax. Because of previously high U.S. tax rates, the employment of an intangibles holding company like we just discussed was widespread. That is, lots of firms besides Pear were using these. The result is that a great deal of intellectual property, or IP, was moved offshore. And in fact, to avoid more complex shifting issues, much of it started to be developed offshore. Thus, the U.S. was losing a great deal of research and experimentation work to other countries based solely on tax law. In an effort to bring some of that IP back into the U.S., the FDII deduction was created. Similar to the QBI deduction for pass-throughs, income generated from intellectual property in the U.S. will benefit from a 37.5% deduction. This has the effect of lowering the U.S. tax rate to just above 13% if the income is generated in the U.S. The net result from a policy perspective is that guilty 
penalizes U.S. businesses with large offshore IP. And FDII rewards U.S. firms with lots of U.S. IP. Well, we are almost done with Module 4. One more international tax video and a summary, and we'll be at the end of the tax module for good. Except for that pesky quiz, those two projects, the midterm exam... Okay, well either way, you can see we have deviated a great deal from the textbook on the international tax area. Because unfortunately, it of course has not been revised to reflect the tax law changes. We've been able to cover most of the tax law changes in the other areas, but international is so drastically different, it's too much to take on at full scale. As a result, your quizzes and exam questions on this topic are likely to be limited. And that's always good news. Thanks for watching.